So here we are, episode 40, The Rose Woman from Taboo to Liberation. The name, by the way, is meant to evoke rose as in risen, as in a gentler form of woke, and to point to the unfolding, complex perfection of the female form with all of its layers. And the rose also has been a symbol of everything from social justice movements to the Magdalene, the holy, sexual, practical, wise female part of Christianity. You know, if you Wikipedia rose symbolism, it's a very long list. But for my purposes, it's about waking up gently. About getting a little more freedom in our heart space and inviting a change in beliefs. That may lead to more sovereignty and connection, more power and ease in our lives. Definitely to an unwinding of unhelpful beliefs. But you may wonder, who am I, Christine Marie Mason, by name, to talk about these things? You know, where am I coming from? What's my bias? What's my experience base? So it's been suggested that I give you a reintroduction to the pod and who I am. You probably know some of the facts if you've been listening. I'm a mother, matriarch, four bio kids, two additional kids, started seven companies now, including Rosebud Woman, the one that, you know, helps me make this pod happen. I've written a lot of books on connection, on activism, poetry, living with reverence. I'm a yogi, a tantrika. But as the sting song goes, you can pour over everything. You can pour over everything in my CV and still know nothing about me. That's how I feel. So as a way of introduction, rather than a long linear story, I'm going to tell you some short stories from my life about profound meetings with other people. Because these profound meetings are pointers to my own trajectory but also to moments in time that stand out in high relief because they changed either how I saw myself or how I understood the world or because they had incredible depth or insight or some intense burning or alive quality to them. Some of these profound meetings for me have been with animals or with books, but for today's purposes, I'm going to tell just stories about a few people. Now, I've met tons of people in my life. I would say tens of thousands Um, Yet the meetings I consider profound, I can count on my fingers and toes. And while some of my deepest friendships come out of circumstance and proximity, probably for you also, and then they over time get kind of richer and more considered, they seem to be more of a migration or a walking together, not something where you're like, woo, recognition, turn on a dime, and all of a sudden you have a new understanding. And just because something's a profound meeting doesn't mean it turns into a friendship although it might, or it doesn't have to turn into a teacher-student relationship, although it might. But sometimes it's just a very short-lived thing that shifts the way you're pointing, and those are the ones that that came up for me. So I'm going to just pause here and ask you what have been the profound meetings in your life, and what's your first hit? Pay attention to the first hit. When I was interviewing this woman around animal communication or around telepathy in general, even human-to-human telepathy, She said uh, that it always works in pictures. Like the first hit you get is an image of someone or an image of a color, and that before the mind intervenes, the linguistic mind intervenes and tries to make a story out of it, just notice who pops up first. And so when I was selecting stories, say, what would be instructive or helpful or useful to you? Who would I like to introduce you to um, by way of these stories? It was interesting which ones came to mind, because some were actually a little obscure, and uh, like I was thinking about, I, I had this flash of a woman who was briefly my boss when I was 27, Jill Manchester, just a very disciplined, focused, activated woman. And she was mentoring me a little bit. And she said, uh, during a review, you know, you have a choice to make, you can either adjust yourself to meet the world, or you can be yourself and surround yourself with a buffer zone of others who can help interpret you to the world so that you can continue magnifying your gifts. I mean, it was short. It was a five-minute conversation, but it woke me up to standing in my own power. That's one example. Her her face came to mind immediately. Or a professor that I had in grad school, Marty Stoller, who has since died, sadly. But how he just understood that the world was language and looked at me and said, The minute you weave a spell with your words, the world will follow you. He demonstrated that. He was a rhetoric professor, but also a great strategic consultant and strategist. So they came to mind, but I'm not telling those stories today. But I just want to point that out because it aims us in the direction of how impactful we are. 
how we are working on each other all the time and how each of us matter and each interaction with someone has the potential to matter if we're awake to it. So thanks for joining me. This is an unusual episode, but I think there are a lot of good wisdom in these stories and bonus, you'll get to know me a little bit better. So here we go. Story one. Now, if you've ever been to Kentucky in August, you'll know that the air is like walking through the rainforest and the red clay soil is sticky and you're sweating constantly, even without moving. And if you are in Kentucky in Fort Knox and you're in ROTC cadet training, you know that you're up at 4 a.m., and you're running hills called Agony and Misery before sunrise. And that's what I was doing in the summer of 1984. I had just turned 18, and due to a bunch of circumstances, didn't really have the financial wherewithal to complete school without supporting myself. And I was working three jobs, teaching in the public schools English uh, support, like coaching English for kids, I was bartending underage illegally. I had an aerobic dance business I was running. And I got approached by a man on campus to consider doing my patriotic duty and joining the Army. So I did, which involved taking leadership courses and reading Sun Tzu and walking around while all the other sorority girls were wearing their colors in an Army cadet uniform every Friday. Very interesting experience, like that little tight pencil skirt, high heels, little hat, very cute. But it wasn't until I dropped in, you know, I'd started college at 16. So by 18, I was between my junior and my sophomore and junior year. And that's the year you go to uh, basic training. So I get to Fort Knox. And, you know, I don't really think of myself as an athlete. I'd been a gymnast. I was, you know, fit to a certain extent. And I didn't think of myself as a leader. I was still in this, I I wanted to say post-apocalyptic, weird slip of the mind, this phase where, uh, you know, I was still recovering. My mom had died. We lived in Iran. It was like a crazy time. And I I hadn't yet come into myself, I guess. So I get to Fort Knox, and they divide us up into squads and platoons, and we go off and live with, and these are blended platoons. It's it's like uh, men and women on the same squads. And anyway... We start moving every morning, like athletic stuff that I never thought I could do. And we're bivouacking, and we're marching in formation, and we're learning how to clean these M16s and shoot them. And and it was just such an intense time of contrast. And we're sort of at a peak point in the training where we've been asked to go out for a three-day bivouac and basically live off the land. And the, it's miserable. It's like rain pouring down, slippery mud. We're camping, and everybody's spirits are flagging. And something in me bubbled up. And I stood up on a log and just like gave this inspiration speech, completely uninvited, ha- telling everybody how great they were doing, how we're going to get through it together, blah, blah, blah. So my staff sergeant this guy, Staff Sergeant Collins. I mean, in retrospect, he couldn't have been more than like 25. But at that point, he seemed like an old dude. And uh, he pulled me aside after that. And he said that that had never happened in any of the years that he'd been a drill sergeant. And to keep doing that whenever I was called. And from that point on, every time there was a leadership opportunity in the platoon, he would say, Mason, and bring me forward. So all in all, it was eight weeks, eight weeks of daily interaction with a person who saw more in me than I ever saw in myself. And on the graduation day, I was so irritated because they were calling people from the platoon who were going to get awards at the graduation And I was sulking a little bit under the tree, like, oh, I thought I'd worked so hard and I'd done so well. And, um, you know, nobody told me, 
until he comes up to me and he says, okay, what are you doing here? Get yourself to the fairgrounds. And when I got there, I found out that I'd been named one of the top three cadets from 800 who are in the program and top woman overall. And I just had this experience of being seen and being invited to be greater. So that was a very profound meeting with one person, Staff Sergeant Collins, thank you so much, who called something out in me that I didn't know I had. All right, so what do you think of that? I mean, as I tell you, I'm back there immersed in the way like the belt buckle felt on my body and the way the boots felt and this sort of strange community of people who'd come from all over the country who were united by one thing, wanting to serve. Okay, story number two, profound meeting number two. This is significantly later. I'm going to jump 20 years. It's 2007. I have been practicing yoga for maybe seven years at this point. I had been chief marketing officer of a company in Chicago, one that I had started, had raised a lot of venture money. I had four little kids at home. Uh, my marriage was not going well by, it, by any measure. And when I was in the depths of this situation, like in, I would say, 1999. So it's a summer day in Chicago, and I run into my friend David, who at that point is like running a company that makes the George Foreman grill and a bunch of other stuff. He's a big deal. And he looks amazing. He's fit. He's trim. He's brown. He's smiling. And I said to him, what happened to you? You look amazing. And he said, yoga happened to me. You've got to come because you look terrible. I'm going to pick you up Friday lunch and we're going to go. And I went to yoga with him. And I got into this little room over a pizza parlor in Chicago uh, with an ohm symbol painted on the walls. And this was in the early days of power yoga, you know, just vinyasa, ashtanga vinyasa. This woman, Jodi, uh, who is still teaching, an amazing teacher in Los Angeles. Now, she watched me. And when I got to Shavasana, I realized it was the first time that I had relaxed in as long as I could remember. And she said, you would probably really enjoy Baron Baptiste. You should, you should go. Anyway, that whole thing, that, that day changed my life because it took me onto a, a path of integrating the mind-body. So I'm studying yoga. I'm practicing yoga. I study with Baron. I study with Rod Stryker, who's in a power yoga, just a very intellectual guru system of yoga. He had so much knowledge that I wasn't ready to receive at the time, but a lot of it stayed with me. And I'm going along, but I'm applying all of the ascension, achievement, principles of like capitalism and the things that I've been entrained in, get better, be a star, all that stuff to my yoga. And then one day in 2007, I show up at the Esalen Institute for a little retreat. Now, Esalen is the birthplace of the human potential movement. Uh, in the 1960s, it's where Gestalt therapy was started and Rolfing and where Hunter Thompson went and wrote his books. I mean, if you ever get a chance, read the history of the Esalen Institute. So this is situated in Big Sur along Highway 1, and it's at this incredible intersection of three waters, fresh water coming down in, from the mountains, the salty water of the ocean, and these sulfur hot springs coming out of the side of the hill. And it's, it's considered very holy. The Esalen Indians live there. This was their ceremony grounds in the summer. So Esalen is devoted to health and healing, and they're having a yoga week. And by this point, I'm living in California. My life has already significantly changed, and I'm really called to continue and really focus my growth and energy on the psycho-spiritual emotional work on consciousness. And I walk into this room, and there's a lanky, long-haired man with a New Zealand accent, and I am doing my handstands, doing my headstands, you know, doing all the Jimmy things, and he says, what are you doing? What are you doing? You are doing gymnastics. Where is your breath? Where is your yoga? And he said, 
I just want you to know, and this is it, drumroll, profound meeting begins, there is nowhere to get to. Right now, right here, your breath in, your breath out, you are participating in life itself. Everything is as it should be. You are perfectly fine the way you are. All right, ladies and gentlemen. If some profound yogi looks in your face and with his full heartfeltness tells you there's nowhere to get to and you are perfectly fine the way you are, and all of a sudden a key turns in a lock and it starts rippling out, the the, the tumbler just unlocks all kinds of doors and your entire approach to spiritual development and consciousness changes. That's grace. Now, Mark did go on to be a teacher for me over many years. He's written wonderful books. Um, The most recent one is God and Sex, which he co-wrote with Rosalind Atkinson. But he wrote The Yoga of Heart and many other books, but they're all aimed at returning us to the idea that we are the, the seed of us is perfectly formed just like anything else in nature. And to stop trying so hard, stop striving, and just enjoy your breath and a gentle movement and just be. Anyway, I would point you to heartofyoga.com if you want to learn more about him. He's got lots of online courses, and uh, that was a very profound meeting. And I've continued to visit with him once or twice a year for the last 12 years now, 16 years. I don't know. I'm losing track. 14 years. Thank you. Profound meeting, Mark Whitwell. Are you with me still? Do you want to know more? Can I tell you a couple more stories? All right, I'm going to tell you this one about my friend Jacques. And it's a nice one to follow the story about Mark because it's about the yoga. So it's a little bit after this experience with Mark. And I am working you know, doing an innovation firm and teaching some yoga at a fighting gym in in Northern California and teaching a little bit in studio. Uh, But it's like not really moving me. The studio teaching is not getting me. It's formulaic. People are not really into spiritual development. They're more interested in like having cute butts. No problem with that. I like having a cute butt. But in the fighting gym, it's profound because they've never seen it before. And you know, the, the level of attention with those athletes to, if you give them information to improve their performance, they tune in right away. Like, can they get an advantage? And I really was framing it a lot as how the breath can give you an advantage and also how alignment can protect you from injury. But they were really taking to it. You know, they're probably my most, my richest students. They were the students who attended most deeply and had the most rapid progression. So I wanted to do more of that. And I saw a flyer for James Fox's yoga in prison program. Called to do it. I go to the thing, sign up for it, figure I'm going to help people. I'm going to offer more of this yoga, you know, sort of savory. But I get into the training and everything changes. We're sitting in a circle in Northern California in this yoga studio. And at the front of the circle is this beaming dude in his maybe 60s. And he says, my name is Rusty, and before we begin the training, I would like to apologize to any one of you who's been the victim of a crime. He said, I spent 34 years in San Quentin for killing a woman in the summer of 1977, and I am out now, and I am deeply remorseful for what I've done, and I am devoting myself to teaching young men and others who are in the situation that I was, that another way is possible to avoid further violence, to become a peacemaker. And then he went around and he made eye contact with everyone in the circle. He got to me and I started bawling, just eyes over. I was trying so hard to hold it together, but I could not because my mother had been killed, murdered in the summer of 77, and they had never found her killer. And so I'm having this incredible reaction. I'm just like, that is the first time I've received an apology from anyone. 
And if you can sit up there in that profound power and speak to me like that, then transformation is possible for anyone. And a whole flower of forgiveness opened in my body. But that's not the profound meeting. The profound meeting is what happens at the end of that first class, where Jacques, who'd been sitting next to me, who was the person responsible for this yoga program spinning out of a larger program on transformative justice, approached me and said, would you be willing to come into San Quentin with me? That's a prison in California, and be a stand-in for the victims in our victim offender communication unit as part of our program at Inside Out, which is called Guiding Rage into Power. And I was like, what are you talking about? Go into the prison and talk to people directly uh, 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 you know, about my personal life, not just give them breathing and yoga, which I'm totally comfortable doing. And I said, yes. And the collaboration with Jacques went on for many years as I spoke at graduations, telling my story to the assembled people on how transformative justice really worked in my life. But the first time I went into San Quentin, it was like, if you haven't seen it, if you, have you ever seen like a rook in a chess set? That's what San Quentin looks like, like a castle fortress. It's perched right on the San Francisco Bay. It's um, uh, been there a long time. It's kind of a rickety prison in a lot of ways. It has more programs because of its proximity to the city than many other prisons, like a lot of new prison construction is done very far away from a city like out in a farmland or a community that doesn't have jobs. And while that brings jobs and economic impact to that county, what it does for the prisoners is it removes them completely from their connection to society. So their families can't visit them as often, if at all. Uh, people who want to volunteer and support in education or any other things that go on in the prisons to, to really make people uh, put people in a better position to return to society whole and complete. You know, none of that stuff can happen. So these new locations are kind of a travesty. But this particular one um, is right in San Francisco and it has the most programs ever. But even with all of those programs, the things that work to release happy, participatory people into society are only two. This one Transformative justice, where the emotional experience, the transgenerational experience of pain and suffering and abuse that puts people in situations and leaves them lacking the response capacity to deal with stressful emotional situations that turn to drugs. All of the, you know, I would say so many of their stories involved either childhood abuse or substance abuse. Transformative justice from a psycho emotional perspective, being able to hold your own center being able to speak about your emotions, developing this response capacity, examining the male role belief system, all of these units that they would go through over the course of a year change them. And then the other one is job training, like basically that you come out and you can get a position where you're economically able to make it without resorting to taking from others. So that meeting with shock in that schoolroom, in that yoga school, on that day, opened my eyes up to just how much we are all bound up in each other's suffering. That there is no standalone victim of a crime. That if I'm the victim of a crime, my family is the victim, my community, we all contract and steal up in response to that and create systems that make us fearful of each other. And that the victimizer is usually themselves a victim. And that the only way to begin to unwind these systems is to go straight to the heart of the human soul, the heart of the human, that demonizing and separating doesn't produce a better society. It also turned me on a lot to the structural inequities in America that I'd been blind to. So profound meeting with Jacques on that day, a moment of recognition and a moment that woke me up to the culture. And also probably one of the reasons I do this pod. All right. That's the third story. Do you want one more? Because truly, I could go on. I think I'll give you one more, and then I'll stop for today. So, oof, I don't know. I want to tell you the story about my friend Adam because that trajectory has been a dozen years of magic. And it also led me to 
four or five other magic relationships and profound meetings. So he is a gateway as well. So yeah, I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to continue the yoga story. Because obviously, you know, I'm not going into corporate America and they're asking me to open my heart and to learn who I am and to step into deeper power. Although all this work in the yoga and mindfulness space have definitely made me a better leader in my corporate work and a more proactive advocate for writing and teaching and supporting other people and doing all the other things in society. But a lot of the awakening came through these more esoteric investigations. Okay, here's the last story for today. So I'm in the middle of a year-long yoga teaching renewal with Eddie Modestini and Nikki Doan, who at the time were married and were profound teachers who blended Ashtanga Vinyasa. She was like doing Ashtanga Series 4. They'd studied directly with Patabi Joyce. And Eddie, who had also studied with Iyengar and knew all the basics of, of that. And so they had this beautiful blend of going slow and making the yoga custom for you and going fast and adding breathing and having it athletic. And then Nikki has this, let me tell you, this these profound, her voice is so deep and profound and and she would um, supplement the classes with stories of the deities and what they meant and basically like infuse the postures with a spirit. Uh, she just has a new book that came out, um, Nikki Doan, D-O-A-N-E. I'll put it in the show notes. So I'm in the class with Eddie on that particular weekend and a friend of Eddie shows up just to participate in the weekend and we happen to be doing partner work. The guy walks in the room and he looks at me and I look at him and we're like, you. So uh, we started partnering and we're doing legs up the wall. We're doing all these things. You're basically trying to help your partner identify their alignment. And we just started laughing like everything was funny. It was surreal and weird, but I'd felt like I'd known him my whole life. And what I realized later in retrospect is the way that he interacted was not only out of a complete sort of presence and self-confidence in that moment, but kind of a like, while he was happy that we were get, getting along, there was no identity attached to it. Like, if I got along with him, great. If I didn't get along with him, great. And over the next few years, it was a process of falling into a deep capacity to parse subtleties in what was actually going on, to communicate at such a deep level, to hold his own while a difficult conversation was happening, or to be an inquiry about something that was happening. And the profundity of this meeting was the opening up to the possibility that you could be authentic in relationship, say what you mean, and people would still stay. Now, we have done a lot of things together over the last decade. We've donated together, invested together, sung together, given you know concerts all over the world, traveled to Antarctica and sang to the penguins, to India and sang at the International Yoga Festival. He's invested in my companies. I sit on the board of his nonprofit. It's been a profound friendship. And one of his friends, another person that I would say is a profound meeting, Amy Fox, she reached out and told us both about her teacher, Thomas Hubel. And Thomas is the person that I've been studying collective trauma healing work with for the last few years. He's the person who got me into the PhD program uh, to study consciousness and trauma. And they're the people who introduced me to another good friend of mine, TJ. So when I look at how this meeting of people who also attract others into your world that are high caliber, high functioning, and desire a high degree of presence and integrity, it is, it's magic. It's magic. Interestingly, if I was going to tell you another story, it would be about Elizabeth Walsh, who I met around the same time Adam met separately, and who has also become a deep friend in this circle. She's also a healer and a profound medicine, like plant medicine teacher. So, okay, I just want to end today <sighs> by saying to you, you know, notably, I left out my husbands and other people like my love relationships. Those are also very profound. I left out my children and they were very profound. These are people that I've encountered that have stayed a little bit or a lot. And in the process of their staying, 
have shifted my understanding of myself or deepened my understanding of how we are related to one another in such a way that the only thing I want to do on planet Earth now are things that are related to reducing human suffering and creating more beauty or joy. So that's a little bit about the woman who's talking to you every week and the perspective I bring when I'm interviewing other people, that every person is magical, a set of fascinations, uh, that we are all here to express fully the seed of ourselves that we've been given and to release the programmatic identity that we are, how hard we work, that we are what we accomplish or how much money we make, that we are measured by how good we are in the eyes of the church or in the eyes of our family, but that we let those sheaths come away so that we can express more and more the seed of what we're here to do from our unique place on planet Earth, our unique perspective at this time in history. So I'm going to keep doing it. Every week I'm going to interview someone or share some piece of research or knowledge that I've been doing on moving from secrecy and shame and taboo or even unexamined belief into more spaciousness and more freedom, to being Rose, to being the ever unfolding woman or man, you know, I believe in the androgynous soul, and to bringing that forward and walking it in the world. So if you want to connect with me, I'm the.rose.woman on Instagram. My company that makes intimate and skin care products, beautiful, organic, beautiful, beautiful products is Rosebud Woman on Instagram and rosewoman.com. And I would love to hear from you. And if you would help me in achieving my goal of 10,000 subscribers by the end of this calendar year, I would really appreciate it. Just subscribe, tell others, and receive in this moment all my love and blessings. <laughs>